Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. Recently, NVIDIA announced its A100 GPU, the first high-end AI chip from NVIDIA since 2017. This chip is fast, hot, and huge, and really sets the stage for AI hardware for the next few years. To discuss its implications, I am joined by two of the most original voices covering semiconductors today, Por Teich, Principal Analyst at Lifter, a semiconductor veteran who has spent over 20 years at AMD, and Dylan, who is a data scientist by trade and writes about semiconductors on his website, semianalysis.com. I am James Wang, Internet Analyst at ARC. Please enjoy this episode. Today, we're talking about NVIDIA's GTC that they did virtually today. Obviously, in the age of coronavirus, the conference is canceled, so everything was dropped as a series of videos online on YouTube. So I'll just kind of summarize kind of the new announcement, and we can jump in whichever direction that you think would work well. It's pretty well known that people were expecting a new data center chip. The current one is called Volta. The new chip is called Ampere. These are named after famous scientists. It is based on TSMC's seven nanometer process. TSMC makes kind of customizations and works with their customers on process. And Jensen said this was a process that worked specifically on to enable this GPU. The specs are everything you would expect. It's the largest GPU ever. It's the largest chip, I think, right now on seven nanometer. It's 54 billion transistors. And in kind of apples to apples performance, it's about two and a half times faster than Volta. In addition, there are some new kind of software and optimization features. One is called MIG, which basically splits up the GPU into multiple eight little slices that can be used independently. This is great for cloud computing where you want to kind of have multiple tenants use your GPU. It's kind of the next step for GPU virtualization. So I think that would be great with hyperscalers. Another one they talked about is sparsity. Neural networks is all about matrix multiplication And a lot of the times these matrices have just zero or near zero results. And we already know from high school math that multiplying by zero yields zero. So these are redundant operations that on current architectures take up basically all the full power and and compute resources of the chip. So they have some optimizations to eliminate those kind of operations, which they claim will increase performance effectively by 2x. Lastly, they kind of made some announcements in relation to their most recent acquisition, Mellanox, which is an Israeli company that deals with interconnect and switch technology. They obviously already use Mellanox products in video servers, but in this case, they built a new network adapter card, a GPU network adapter card all in one, which is kind of a hybrid monster I've never seen before. So curious to get your takes on that. But that's kind of the high level announcements today. I think They also have some graphics announcements and HPC, but I think all eyes are really focused on AI and data center. So I'll start with Paul. What did you think of kind of what they came out with? Was it what you expected? What are you most interested or surprised by? A lot of questions unraveled there, but at a top level, Jensen doubled down on big, hot GPUs. So I think what would have surprised me more would be if they had done one of a couple things, maybe in concert. If NVIDIA had chosen to jettison the GPU transistors and do a deep learning only product, that would have been really surprising. And if they had chosen to do smaller chips, more power conserving, aiming toward really small IoT end devices, I would say that would have been a surprise. But what they did was what a kind of expected, which is double down on big, hot GPUs, now 400 watts. And so the depth of that double down is important. 
because that is going to leave gaps for people who are doing more interesting things. So at the same time, this GTC keynote happened at the tail end of OCP Summit. At OCP Summit, Facebook said, okay, we're the customer of this neat little M.2 FPGA carrier that Intel built and showed last year at OCP Summit. Oh, yeah, we're the customers. So Facebook is deploying this for inferencing. And that's a completely different direction where you're doing like micro transactions on inferencing. And so they tried to split up this big GPU. It's not really virtualized. It's, I think, seven hard partitions. I'm not sure what they do with the eighth, but they kept saying seven. And so that was a little odd. But they maybe that's the master in terms of controlling what goes on with others. It's master of the defect. Yeah, I, probably so. With, the thing is like 824 square millimeters. I mean, it's huge. It's a radical busting monster. It's just the, the size. They really reinforced that not only are they not backing down on building big products that still do graphics, mixed GPU and AI processing, but they're just going for all of the It may be efficient in terms of operations per watt if you have a lot of operations to do, but you have to want to use a lot of operations. I'll just stop there. We can talk later about the networking and all that aspects. I think the core DNA of NVIDIA has just been resolutely reinforced. Dylan, your thoughts? Quick side note on why they kept saying seven. There's eight GPCs on the die one is disabled. So that's why they kept saying seven virtualized. I'm sure eventually they'll have the eighth fully enabled chip. So let's back up to, I think this is sort of an inflection point for NVIDIA as a company. We look back and we see they've been talking about general purpose GPU compute for so long, and they've built this dominating market share, this entire software ecosystem, and their GPUs have been better and better at becoming general purpose compute powerhouses. And this Amper announcement is almost like taking a step back and pivoting in the other direction. And the reason I say that is if you look at the architecture, there's more specialized components now than ever before. If we talk about the Volta chip that they refreshed at the tail end of last year, the V100S, and then you compare the double precision flops from that to the A100, you actually have a regression in performance per watt. You're only going from about 8.2 to 9.7 teraflops of double precision compute, which is you've got almost two nodes worth of shrinking. You've got more than doubling of transistor count, and yet you've got this amenic gain in double precision teraflops. I think they would say that they're trying to move the double precision and really all the heavy vector math into the tensor cores. Like one of the things they did with the tensor cores this generation was to basically enable all the number formats right up to double precision. Definitely. This path of them going more and more generalized has allowed them to build this software ecosystem in Moat. And now that they are here and they're pivoting to something more specialized and they have this lock-in that they love and a lot of people in the industry hate, but they can't do anything about it. (laughs) They're sort of making it so their chips are not just a general purpose workhorse, not replacing the CPU. Now they're trying to combat a completely new enemy. They're not trying to take over the CPU market. They're trying to fight off these AI startups. They're trying to fight off a lot of different companies in this space. And so that's why they have, you look at the double precision, normal teraflops, and you're talking about this is a regression in performance per watt. Then you look at int 8, Bflow, TF32, all these different number formats that they have, there's incredible gains. And then a lot of the features you mentioned and the switching power, this chip is capable of 4.8 terabits a second of switching. That's ridiculous. It is quite crazy. We talked a lot about kind of that missing eighth core. I actually just tweeted something out because I was wondering this as well. And here, I'll just share my screen. And NVIDIA has been basically disabling pieces of their GPUs for a number of years now. The last time they had a full GPU in any volume was back in 2008 with GT200. That was, I think, 280 cores, and that was all turned on. And then starting with Fermi, they swept out one of the cores And ever since then, some of the cores have been swept out. But they've held it steady at roughly 93, 95% of silicon being active or usable. But with Ampere, it's seven out of eight. So it actually came down below 90% for the first time. And they cut memory too. In what sense? So there's six stacks of HBM, but only five of them are enabled. Oh, I didn't see that. That's interesting. Why would they need to do that since the HBM memories are 
I presume, verified ahead of time. Those are known could die, but I think it's probably memory bandwidth through the cores. I see. Could it be that if you disable one of the clusters, you disable one of the memory controllers, so you can't talk to the HBM? That would be an unfortunate bit of architecture, but I've seen worse. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I think it's you can test the HBM before you place it onto the interposer, but there's still errors when you place it on the interposer. And this is a 2x reticle size interposer that they're using, probably the largest that TSMC has manufactured in volume. I'm sure there's some placement errors here. So they could have all six enabled. I'm sure they will enable all six at some point next year with a bit of a less cut down die. But I think it's right now, it's just a yield thing. That's interesting. I missed that. Great point. On your point about them being more specialized, I still see them going after kind of the CPU and enterprise workloads with this. One announcement they made on the software side was that they're going to accelerate Spark, which is very popular for big data analytics. They've been working on, there's been various pieces of GPU acceleration, but I think this is the first time they're doing, they kind of completed a major re-architecture so that you can run Spark on it. Have you had time to kind of dig into that at all? I haven't had time to dig in explicitly. I will say the one thing they did that was noteworthy in terms of who their competition is, putting AMD in the DGX HDX was very pointed. Also announcing that CUDA is now ARM enabled for 64-bit ARM processors, very pointed. They're being completely agnostic to processor partners and trying to help their data center customers just buy the right part for the right application. So for context, the last box that they shipped had two Intel Xeon processors, and now it seems like it's one AMD Opteron. Oh, yeah. No, Opteron, sorry. It's, I know, it's epic. It's two epic still. Oh, it's two? I saw yeah. that. Huh, okay. For the AGX with four GPUs, I believe it's one epic, but with the one that has two, then it's two. One thing, I guess, when you look at the block diagram for how the chip is laid out, it has all these different kinds of cores. We're used to kind of just seeing standard data paths, lots of copies of the same thing. But over time, NVIDIA's GPUs has standard data paths. It has these tensor cores, it has double precisions, many different kinds. I thought the best interpretation of this was actually from the folks at GraphCore, who basically said this is their strategy of managing dark silicon. Moore's law in 2020 isn't the same as back in 1990, when every transistor you get, you can turn on and have them do useful work. Now, if you turn, A, you can't even turn them on at the manufacturing level because many are going to be defective if you build something this big. B, even if they're not defective, you turn 85 billion transistors on, it's like dropping a nuke in the middle of the chip. It's going to melt the whole darn thing. You can only effectively switch on some fraction of the transistors you get. And by having these, some data paths for double precision or kind of high performance computing, some for AI, some for graphics, you're only turning on a fraction of the chip at a time. And that naturally manages kind of the dark silicon problem. They view that as a weakness that can be overcome, but it's interesting as a solution. I mean, do you guys feel that's a fair interpretation of how they're architecturing it? And it's kind of a clever way to build once and shoot at three different markets. Yeah, I agree with that. A lot of their thought process, I think, is going to simplifying the buying journey to the big, expensive, hot part without very many options to maintain their margin in data center acceleration. If they started to separate those data paths into different products, if you said, I am never running double precision on this, I need to do inference, you can actually build a better, faster, cheaper part, cheaper being the operative word. Somebody's not going to pay as much for a part that can't do the floating point parts in your data center. So they're still counting on this being a really general purpose, all-purpose player in data center architecture instead of proliferating the architecture and building parts that are better at inference, better at training, and then, oh, can do graphics. <laughs> and so I think that's, it goes back to their core DNA of who they want to be. They're not ready to take the graphics out. They're not ready to say, okay, we're going to take lower margins for inference-only parts. I heard that loud and clear. We are going to do inference really fast. We're going to make sure, but you have to pay a lot of increments of a lot of money in your data center to do inferencing really fast. And we'll have to see what the inferences per second per watt looks like for different workloads on this really big processor that probably could use a lot of batch throughput as opposed to having a lot of smaller inferencing processors that are aimed at doing one and two, just small transactional type of processing. So I think it's a financial and positioning decision 
to keep everything in one basket. And I agree, whatever application you're running on this, there's a lot of dark silicon and 400 watts is still a tight envelope <laughs> for what they're trying to do. Yeah, and I think that strategy you laid out is probably exactly what they have in mind. I didn't think about that more before now, but trying to keep their margins as high as possible means you can't split these products out and specialize them. The other thing that's quite important to note is that you look at the other training silicon providers, no one has something that's quite as scale up and scale out as NVIDIA has produced here. There are some people like Cerberus who can scale up within a node because they have a wafer scale processor really, really high. And then you've got folks like Habana and GraphCore who have these capabilities to scale out to many, many nodes. But who has something with eight reticle sized chips, 4.8 terabits a second of switching to each other in every direction? Plus, you can scale out to hundreds of nodes and you can buy a DGX super pod from NVIDIA and get it built in three weeks. I don't think anyone has quite that level of scale up or scale out in combination. And with the biggest training workloads, there's really no other option besides paying out your nose for an NVIDIA solution. That's a great point. And I think to some extent, this is a backwards compatibility story. Maybe not for people who just want to do inferencing. This is not the product they're looking for. But if you're going to pay that much money for a pod cluster, for a super pod, then you want it to be able to do some other stuff. You don't want it solely dedicated to AI training. That's a great point in that they're aiming for a large class of jobs with a capability no one else has, and maybe some other deployment capabilities have to ride along with that. That's not the primary reason you buy the part, but over the next year, I'm sure we'll see that play out as more inferencing specific parts hit the market. We're looking right now at Amazon rolling out its Inferentia part as part of its public cloud. Inferentia was developed to go deploy Alexa with. And so go see who's biting, kind of what the uptake is in which regions for Inferentia will tell us a lot about what people might or might not use this new A100 for. I thought one interesting, I guess, difference in strategy this time, previously NVIDIA has built large cards for training and smaller cards for inference, which is kind of how we think about the market. You want a tiny little accelerator card like the one for Facebook in every server. But in this case, and also prior to this announcement, Jensen did an interview with the Next Platform. He talked about kind of this desire to unify both inference and training inside the same processor. And I thought that was an interesting reversal in direction. And I mean, how does the previous narrative fit in? How is that compatible with this? If I want to scale out, I don't want a 400 watt thing that's bigger than the CPU inside the server. That doesn't seem to make sense. The only kind of way I can explain this is, I guess, the, the new software feature they've built, which is called multi-instance GPU or MIG, that basically takes this one ampere GPU and splits it into eight independent mini GPUs where you can send workloads to. Maybe that will solve the batch size and batching problem. I don't even know if you can treat them as independent batch targets. What do you guys think? I think they're not abandoning that strategy quite yet. I think it's what products do they have ready? And right now, what do they have? They have the SmartNIC from Mellanox from their acquisition, and they've got their massive new GPU. Put them together, and this definitely hits a market, might not hit it perfectly. But I think there's no doubt in my mind they're working on something that's probably not six stacks of HBM, $10,000 plus. Something that's a bit smaller, uses cheaper memory or less of it, and it's more like a Habana NIC product. It's one chip that has all the switching capabilities and the inference capabilities. There's no doubt that they're working on something like that. And remember that splitting this thing into eight different sub die, if you just cut this up, these are still big honking processors. They're not really little when you break it up. They're still pretty respectable size. I was looking at the networking card that they introduced with this chip kind of embedded on it. I think they just took the carrier and expanded it out with a PCI Express connector for Mellanox. That's really a lot of wattage for a PCI card. That's what I thought. It's the weirdest network adapter ever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's got to be the biggest, most expensive. And even then, it's, I agree, they have to be scaling it down at some point. But at the same time, I think they have decided to split their consumer and data center product lines. That's the big decision there. So I think we will see a split where they've got some products on the graphics side that don't have TensorCore in them. 
I didn't see a ray tracing core block in this diagram. I don't know if they omitted it or it's just not there. I'm going to guess it's not there. I'm going to guess the ray tracing is not there. And that's where they're kind of drawing the line. And we'll find out more about that over the next few days. I've asked some questions. I don't have answers yet. As to, they said they're going to be selling chips for the whole solution to some of their manufacturing partners. So if you want to build an HGX2. And so my question was, really, are you selling the NV switch parts outside of NVIDIA? What kind of relationships do you have to go do that? Because I hadn't really seen that in the previous generation. Microsoft had demonstrated some stuff at OCP events, but didn't really see widespread acceptance. So that'll be really interesting as they try and supply the solution piecemeal to folks to assemble their own HGX, HGX2 solutions. Because I have to imagine that a lot of their hyperscale customers have asked, can you work with our contract manufacturer? I really don't want to pay NVIDIA to go do this, but I want the capability want the chips, they've got high values. So can we work with somebody to bring some of the cost out of it? We don't need the really cool faceplate that has to go. <laughs> so my data center doesn't need to look that pretty. Nobody sees it. But that brings us back again to Mellanox had a relationship with Xilinx. I think that's probably broken at this point. So the Innova card, so they had the Innova 2 FPGA enabled programmable card. I think that's gone. Jensen hates FPGAs. That's a great way to get him to launch a 15-minute diatribe. The, <laughs> just mention the acronym sometime in his presence. We'll see where that gets you. But what we saw was Bluefield 2, which is an ASIC solution that has a lot of the BMC and management and networking stack functions offloaded. So they're doing the sidecar thing. Adding that to some of this offload capability could get them into something like a Microsoft Catapult, Alibaba's X-Dragon, AWS Nitro. Just for non-technical audience, those are all kind of smart network interface card adapters for the cloud. Correct. What they're doing, Nitro and X-Dragon are about even. They've offloaded not just the BMC and the management functions, not just the virtualization stack, but they've also offloaded the hypervisor. So you can actually run your instance at whatever the processor speed is with whatever the accelerator is. Microsoft is using FPGAs in their catapult because they're doing some AI processing in the network layer. And they haven't decided on an architecture yet. So FPGA is that general purpose solution for them. But this could be how NVIDIA gets into that really smart NIC offloading a lot of the really intelligent threat detection kind of stuff. So we'll see. But I think they are thinking way forward as we see companies like Pensando start to get into the smart NIC business. We're going to see maybe some consolidation because the big clouds have already designed their own solutions. But now we're looking at the tier two clouds. We're looking at the telcos who maybe don't have those design aspirations, don't need to own their own destiny in the same way. And having somebody like NVIDIA now with the Mellanox purchase help them out with that, not just the sidecar for all of those stuff you don't want the processor to do, but to actually add value in a data center spanning way to do the threat detection, to do some maybe intelligent traffic flow analysis in real time. Data center is about security and data flow at a networking level. And I think this will really help out a lot, but it's not this year. It's going to be next year, year after. Dylan, you've wrote a lot about kind of the potential for integrating smart NICs and GPU into the kind of data center fabric. Did you see anything today that kind of points you to one direction or another, which way they want to go? Paul hit the head of the nail pretty well, but so really it's about what's Bluefield 3 going to look like from Mellanox. As I pointed to earlier, they're going to integrate GPU and the smart NIC into one die, into one solution. And it's probably not going to be, you know, a $10,000 plus card. That's just not feasible. So what level of GPU is on there? Right now, there's, what, 8 or 16 small ARM cores plus no GPU. They're going to bring that up to, what, 16 a bit larger ARM cores, a decently sized GPU. You do inference. You offload everything. That makes a lot of sense to me. Why does the GPU and the network chip want to merge? Like, what could you do with that versus the current architecture of them being a little bit more distant? There's just the general purpose of the GPU for any sort of compute. Clearly, Paul's more versed in 
what exactly network cards are processing. But there's things like threat detection or there's a lot of different pieces of the network stack that could be offloaded to the GPU in a more efficient manner than the ARM cores that are sitting on there. There's inferencing that can be done on a number of things that would also be done a lot more efficiently. At the end of the day, attacking the CPU, you want to take as many processing elements away from the CPU and get as much market share for yourself. And that's really the target. When I see just, when I take a step back, I really, if you imagine this very merged, it's almost like Xilinx have their ACAP, their Versa processor, which is like a merger of SOC and FPGA and DSPs. But, but this thing will have an NVIDIA GPU that's Ampere or next generation, will have a smart NIC, it will have an actual network interface controller. It's like NVIDIA has contemplated many times going head on against Intel, and they've sort of not quite done that. And it almost seems like their strategy is not to beat Intel or Ampere at building a CPU, Ampere, the ARM company, but rather just to get so smart and so capable that it sucks all the oxygen or workload out of the CPU so that it becomes maybe in the long run, just kind of this lame administrator of the computer rather than the central brain of the computer. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It's a surrounding strategy of bracketing your opponent is a time-honored tradition in warfare. I think Sun Tzu way back when, Napoleon. So on one hand, you're taking away the high value actual workload in the data center of doing the training, doing the workload inferencing. And on the other side, you're taking away all the tasks that you are very well defined that are administrative tasks that don't contribute to successfully running a workload. You're offloading those into a sidecar also has a lot of value. What we're seeing is that based on Nitro, based on Catapult, based on X-Dragon, the clouds are actually keeping older instance types around longer in the cloud. So they still actually stop pricing stuff and retire infrastructure. But we're kind of noticing the life cycles extending as Moore's law ends. So we still see clouds deploying Haswell, Broadwell, Skylake's just becoming popular as they're shipping Cascade Lake. And so the lag time seems to be stretching out. And Amazon even mentioned that on their earnings call. They said that they were increasing the server life, the depreciation schedule, I think from three to four years, increases their margins. That's very interesting. Let's kind of look at competition now because we all track these companies that are getting funding to build the next great AI chip company to compete against NVIDIA. At one point, I was very concerned. I thought that if you build a blank slate, chip, it should do much better than something that has 20 years of DirectX kind of legacy built in. But in the last year or two, it just seems that NVIDIA is executing the PowerPoint of those companies better than those companies are themselves. And I think like adding sparsity was like the latest feature that should have shipped on a second generation AI accelerator that NVIDIA is already shipping today. And Dylan, I know you've tried some of these services as well of these new AI chip companies. How do you guys feel about competition of Ampere versus seven nanometers of their competitors that might come out this year or next? Well, it comes down to software. Sure, the hardware is more expensive with NVIDIA, but you've already built how many years of software upon them. And if you want to rewrite, if you want to use a completely new SDK, how much engineering time do you have to spend? Is that worth the transition? For Google, Amazon, Microsoft, sure, you already have been doing this for years. But for a Fortune 500 company that's not a tech company, heck no, you're not leaving the work that you've been building for years. You're not, if you're, like you said, a telco or... How much software migration work is there? Like if, for example, most of these new startups will support TensorFlow and PyTorch. If I basically have my whole thing built in PyTorch, couldn't I just compile on PyTorch? And given that everything under the hood is the poll, should it not work? What are the caveats that a developer is likely to run into, even with the PyTorch support? Yeah, if you're trying to run on one machine, but if you're trying to deploy all across the cloud in all environments, you need containerization, you need these ways to break up the workload into all the various scale-out pieces that you have. It's not as simple as just okay, the actual code runs on this one piece of hardware. How do I manage the traffic? How do I make sure it gets split across all your processors effectively and evenly? Underneath that, even, there's the driver issue. So there's a combinatorial problem with, we call them disaggregated instance types. 
mix and match. I can use this GPU with any of the CPUs over there and those other instances. And what we're seeing is that the clouds have moved over the last couple of years to dedicated accelerators. And what we're seeing there is that they've only paired accelerators with Xeon processors. And each of the clouds has only paired accelerators with a very small palette, very small selection of Xeon processors. And that's to control driver robustness and proliferation. How many combinations of that graphics chip and an Intel part do you need? And do I want to then put an Epic into play or put an ARM-based processor like Graviton or an Ampere or Marvell Thunder X? And what we're seeing right now in the top clouds is that they're keeping the direct attached accelerators on Intel. And we believe that it is to control how robust their data center operations remain. So if something breaks, they can fix it quickly. They don't have a permutation problem. And then you get into, okay, so now I have a driver that pairs my accelerator with my processor. Now I have to build the underpinnings of putting that into containers. So I need to have my Ubuntu drivers. I've got to have my guest OS privileges and the driver. NVIDIA has done a great job of building the plumbing into the hypervisor and working with the hypervisor folks and then building the guest OS plugins for that architecture so that you can see the GPUs through your virtualized instances, through your containers. And that Making that all operate well, I think, is the biggest impediment to these other up-and-coming wannabe. To some extent, it doesn't matter if they really beat NVIDIA's performance. If they don't have solid drivers and if they don't plug into all of the frameworks that developers want to see, and that experience needs to be very pleasant for that cloud operator, for lack of a better word. It can't be too complex. They've got to understand how to manage it, even before a developer sees it. And so that's, I did mention I worked for AMD for a couple of decades. And I think that's the part AMD's weak at. They understand PC graphics drivers, and they've done a great job on that. But I think they just kind of underestimate the level of development investment and support investment that it takes to maintain a presence for GPUs in a data center. Even for CPUs, getting Epic into more clouds, I think they were limited by how much support they could provide in terms of getting stuff qualified. And that's with a part that's 100% compatible with its competitor. So there's actually, once you get out of UEFI in the boot environment, there's not a lot there. There's a little bit of compiler optimization or tools optimization, but that's why they've had such success as a second source manufacturer of the x86 instruction set. I mean, it's all their native development now, but you have to do all those things to go then deploy that. And on the graphics side, there's this whole extra thing that NVIDIA pioneered with CUDA and did an outstanding job of. And they understand enterprise. They understand the stability and robustness. And they have that market lead of having demonstrated it. And so if I'm a graph core or the Habana folks that Intel just bought, that's part of the target. It's part of why you wanted to be bought by Intel because they have 6,000 data center software developers in Hillsborough. And so they can actually help with that. So I expect that Intel's baseline will be a solid deployable product. And I expect that when they get there, it doesn't really matter if it's going to be 10%, 20%, plus or minus NVIDIA, 2 or 3X. It won't really matter as much as having a viable alternative in the ballpark that the cloud can feel good about deploying. It's not going to bite them. Nobody's going to get fired because they went and picked an unstable part or a part with unstable software. So we tend to focus on the hardware development part, but the software, just the infrastructure it takes to deploy these at scale before somebody even writes one application on it is a lot of work. Really great point. And that's the big advantage that NVIDIA has is if you look back at the last earnings call, Jensen proudly proclaimed that NVIDIA has more software engineers than they do hardware engineers. More than half the company is software engineers. Even if you go back all the way to when they launched Fermi, Jensen said NVIDIA is a software company, 
do you have 5,000 software engineers with 10 years of body of work building upon itself to deliver this pretty seamless experience? Now, it's not perfect, but it's definitely better than any other startup. Do these startups have more software engineers and hardware engineers? And do they have years and years of building upon what they already did, working with so many different industries to iterate and create the perfect SDK for that specific environment, whether it's robotics or self-driving or video processing or 5G RAN or anything. All these different SDKs that NVIDIA has built got hundreds of thousands of engineering hours that have just accumulated to make this software moat that is kind of scary. So why the cloud providers want to get away. How do you mean the cloud providers want to get away? Well, the cloud providers, and as well as a lot of the HPC environmenters pushing open standards or pushing their own hardware or pushing something that doesn't tie them into NVIDIA forever. Like the DOE, when they launched their Exascale bids, it was, it has to be SCYL. No, you can't bid with your own proprietary software stack. I think this is a good point to close on, which is when I think about the competitive environment for NVIDIA, the only, I guess, group of companies that I feel have an edge over them, given the software mode, is actually the cloud service providers. They have a, a kind of advantage in scale. Basically, all they're sucking up all the world's incremental growth in computing. And B, they control the software stack in a way that never existed before. They basically have as much control over software over enterprise as Apple has control over software over consumer. So they're able to really tightly integrate. They could literally change the stuff under the hood. And so long as you're using their front end of, it could be DynamoDB or whatever service you're using on AWS Azure, it's completely transparent to the user. But where do you think they want to be long-term? They clearly want to build more of their chips. They've built their own kind of smart NICs. They've built their own CPUs now with AWS Graviton. And they've done their own AI accelerators with Inferentia and TPUs. Can you see a point where A, NVIDIA prices their stuff pretty high, Jensen's pretty hard to negotiate with. But if I were sitting in the kind of shoes of these hyperscale folks, I would think that over time, I want to be as much in control over silicon as Apple is in control of silicon with its A series of processors. I think that's absolutely right. I think the Super 7, let's take it out, maybe the top dozen or so clouds are all working on AI acceleration, specifically with respect to lowering the cost of inferencing transactions. And so they all find it difficult. Google found it difficult with TPU to commercialize it. So you can commercialize it only through TensorFlow. I think PyTorch is still in beta or maybe just came out of beta. We're looking at AWS. Inferentia support is only through a specific tool chain that AWS provides. So they haven't developed that all-purpose solution yet for their in-house chips. They've deployed it in their internal capability. So AWS is building data centers dedicated to serving Alexa, and they control that whole development chain and deployment chain. And so they built Graviton, Graviton2, they built Inferentia, but we never see that. So as an external developer going and buying an IaaS instance, I'm not internal. I don't have their internal tools that I have to learn. I want to use TensorFlow or PyTorch or something else. And so surfacing the tools I need to go write my own random app on AWS is difficult. And that's where they're at right now is trying to wring out those tools and wring out what platform they want to offer that on. So you have to think they want to offer Inferentia on ARM, because that's what they're doing internally, but that's not what they're doing externally, because they have to control the deployment environment. So right now, Inferentia is attached to a Xeon processor, and it's got this kind of little sandbox you can play in and develop things for it. And we'll see how far that goes, because that is all investment that doesn't affect AWS's core business. They have to have an ROI for if I develop this, how many people are going to actually pay for it and use it to develop and deploy apps. Interesting. At the end of the day, I think NVIDIA's overarching strategy is not going for the Super 7, just as you mentioned, because they're trying to ditch you no matter what. They have the capital and the scale to where in-house is just the obvious answer. What NVIDIA is trying to do is public cloud, partially, yes, but more so the mid-sized players, the in-house, because not every workload is going to go on the public cloud, no matter how much people drone on about it. There's going to be a lot of on-premises or edge that's owned by 
Fortune 500 companies. There's 20, 30 different telco companies in the world that all have their own software stack and all own hardware purchases. That's a market that NVIDIA could dominate. And they don't have the scale besides a few of them maybe to develop their own hardware and complete 100% software stack. They'd rather virtualize everything and have it easy to tweak and have a very complete SDK. Same with like say a Mercedes or a BMW. They're not, or a Walmart, maybe not Walmart, but they're not going all on public cloud, but at the same time, they don't have the scale for their own hardware. And they have their own software that they've built for years. Well, they want something that works, even if it costs a little bit more, not hundreds of thousands of more engineering hours to make a complete software stack. That's a great point. I guess to the extent that we don't have massive cloud consolidation, that all of the world's work goes into a Super 7, there will always be pretty reliable business for NVIDIA because there will be plenty of companies that need help and that's not going to build their own custom silicon. I would leave with one closing thought, which is there's a lot of room under a $200,000 server box. He seemed very proud of that $199,000 <laughs> DGX box. You buy them, you say? <laughs> Got it. Check. Great slogan, but there's a lot of space under there for enterprises to figure out what they want before they make that big investment. It is a big investment. It's a lot of power per rack. It's not even just a box. It's where are you going to put it? <laughs> so I think there's room for a lot of competition. NVIDIA has clearly staked out a very high-end play here. We will see it trickle down to some smaller derivatives of this chip, but they've made their statement. So <laughs> I think the rest of the field has got to figure out the software angle, how to provide a stable environment on-prem or off-prem, because on-prem is going to private cloud and you still need stability. You still need to have that self-service, self-orchestrated, somewhat even lights out in the future. I want my private cloud to look like the public cloud. And that means that everything's got to be bulletproof. That's a great way to end. Paul, thank you so much for your time. Loved your input. And Dylan, always love to get your insight as well. Exciting days ahead. And hopefully we'll see more chips from these companies and we can chat again. Thanks much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Have a good day. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.